Ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's begin. Good way to start. <laughs> if you're able to, please remain standing for approximately the next four minutes while Boy Scout Troop 12 presents the colors. We will then sing the national anthem with Maximilian Rex Burgess Shannon, and then we will follow with Ray Wilson for the Pledge of Allegiance. Then we will hear the invocation from PFW Post 1123 Post Chaplain Steve Bennett. Boy Scout Troop, present the colors. and arms. stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rockets red glare the bombs bursting in That our flag was still there. Whoa, say, does that star spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for, for which it stands under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. Order. Order, arm. Yeah. Will Post Chaplain Steve Bennett please come to the podium? Uh, will the Post Chaplain please come to the podium, please? Uncover up. <clears throat> Almighty God, Father of us all, we, your servants, turn to you for continuance for your blessings upon us. And you who have spared us veterans from the grasp of our enemies, grant us the understanding of your precious comfort. We thank you for the privilege of life and the blessings we enjoy through your graciousness in our country. The land which we are given the freedoms of speech, religion, and the pursuit of happiness. 
Assist us to know you better and the wisdom to acknowledge you as the God of the universe and our idea. In your mercy, may we the living find our peace. Grant us from above this day the challenge of high endeavor, the beauty of humble spirit, the strong courage and will without exertion to continue to glorify you and to praise you and to love you to the end of time. Amen. Amen. Governor. Since the national flag is already raised, the color guard may now march out. Please be seated. We'd like to thank award-winning Boy Scout Troop 12 for their expertly presenting the colors. I'd like to thank U.S. Navy Chief Ray Wilson. He served in World War II, the Korean War, and Vietnam War. I would like to also thank uh, VFW Post 1123 Post Chaplain Steve Bennett. He served during the Vietnam War and was awarded the Combat Action Ribbon and the Vietnam Service Medal. I'd also like to thank uh, Maximum, I can never remember his whole name, <laughs> Maximum, who was an Eagle Scout with True 12. That was a beautiful rendition of the National Anthem. Thank you. Sorry about your name. <laughs> okay, I hope we're all excited. Uh, I'd like to express the gratitude to all the veterans that are here today. Uh, with World War II veterans, please wave your hand. You're a hero, Ray. You are. Korean War veterans, please raise your hands. Thank you for your service. Vietnam veterans, please raise your hand. Thank you for your service. Operation Desert Storm veterans, will you please raise your hand? Thank you for your service. Operation Enduring Freedom veterans, please wave, wave your hands. Thank you for your service. Operation Iraqi Vet, excuse me, Iraqi Freedom veterans, would you please raise your hand? Thank you for your service. Those who are Global War on Terrorism veterans, please raise your hand. Thank you for your service. And the little off strip, there's, there's, a, there's a, been a number of, of small, uh, not small with people who served in, but a number of, of smaller conflicts that didn't get big names. And uh, I want to acknowledge them too. So if you served in any of those, please raise your hand. Thank you for your service. Peacetime veterans. Everybody, everybody had a part. Peacetime veterans, please wait, raise your hands. Thank you for your service. And last but not least, families, friends, caregivers of our troops, and veterans, please raise your hands. Thank you. Thank you because your unconditional love and sacrifice is tremendous help supporting our troops and veterans in the United States of America. I am honored to, to introduce our Mayor of Vallejo, Mayor Robert McConnell is a decorated combat veteran. He's also a life member of VFW 1123. He valiantly served in Vietnam with the, with the U.S. Army 9th, 9th Infantry Old Reliables Division. He was elected to Vallejo City Council in 2011 and elected mayor in November of 2020. 
He specializes in bankruptcy as a full-time attorney with nearly three decades of experience with Chapter 11 and Chapter 13. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mayor Robert McConnell. Thank you. Uh, first off, I want to say thank you on a personal level for being here because as a veteran, it means a lot to us to see the community come out and to the veterans and the friends of the veterans. I want to say on behalf of the City of Vallejo, the City Council and each member of the City Council, how much we greatly appreciate your involvement in our community, how you make it stronger, how you make it better. We couldn't do this without you. The mere fact that you're here today is evidence of your dedication. The proclamation which the City Council has adopted is in the program. You may read it if you wish. Um, I am going to present it to Mr. Howard as the representative of the VFW, but more especially to you. The job of a veteran is never done because we always have new veterans coming in and it is our mission to reach out to them and make them aware of this community and how accepting it is so that they can become a full part of this community and not be watching from the outside with the wounds that are still yet to heal. So thank you for your do what you do and please continue as you have done. Thank you so very much. Mr. Howard, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, before we start with our keynote speakers, I'd like to acknowledge some of, the, of our uh, elected officials or their proxies um, from, the, from federal, state, and local levels. Uh, representing uh, Congressman Mike Thompson, Bill Orpia, please come to the podium. Good morning. Um, the Congressman could not be here today, so he asked me to write, uh, read this letter. It says, Dear Friends, I wish I could be with you today, but work has me another part of our district. Today, we honor the millions of brave men and women who have served our country in uniform. Over a century ago, the Allied powers signed an armistice agreement with Germany that officially ended hostilities of, on the Western Front of World War I. Since then, Armistice Day, now known as Veterans Day in the United States, has provided an opportunity for us to recognize the importance of peace and express our gratitude to former, ser to former service members. As a former soldier and veteran of the Vietnam War, I witnessed the sacrifices that men and women from across our great country have made every day since our nation's founding. By serving in the military, these individuals have dedicated their lives to protecting our country at all costs. From Yorktown and Gettysburg to Iwo Jima in Afghanistan, our service members have made immeasurable contributions to the freedoms we enjoy today. For many, their service continues long after they hang up their uniforms as teachers, firefighters, police officers, civil servants, and an inspiration to future generations. My support for service members does not stop after they have hung up their uniforms. That's why I am proud to have voted for the Honoring Our Pact Act, signed into law by President Biden in August. This provides deserved care for our service members who were exposed to toxic substances during their service. This care is long overdue and is continued, a continued step to support our veterans. To all our veterans and their families, we thank you for our, your service. While we can never fully repay you, we will never forget our responsibility to provide the benefits and support you deserve. Thank you, Mike Thompson, Member of Congress. Thank you for presenting that. Now I'd like to bring up uh, Tom Barty. He's representing State Senator Bill Dodd. Thank you and good morning, everybody. I'm, I'm here this morning on behalf of uh, State Senator Bill Dodd, who regrets he wasn't able to be here today. And I brought with me a um, proclamation for Veterans Day from Governor Newsom, which I'll read. <clears throat> Each November 11th, we pay our respects and offer our thanks to those who served the United States military to defend our freedoms and our way of life. 
The time-honored tribute we celebrate for, as Veterans Day begins more than a century ago, but now we, we show veterans our respect today as important as, as ever. On the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month of 1918, World War I came to an end. After four brutal years of fighting, one year later, America dedicated November 11th as Armistice Day to celebrate the peace and the veterans who fought to make the world a safer place. In 1938, Congress established Armistice Day as a legal holiday to honor those who fought the war to end all wars. However, in the wake of World War II and the Korean War, Armistice Day became Veterans Day in 1954 a holiday to honor veterans of all wars from the past, the present, and the future. Today, California's veterans number 1.6 million, the most of any state in the nation. These men and women are family, friends, and patriots. They're represented across all of California's diverse populations in every facet of our society. They have used what they learned in the military to benefit us all as civilians. And they serve as elected officials, <clears throat> civic leaders in, in, in public safety, and as first responders. They are employees, employers, and help to drive California's world-class economy. Other veterans weren't so fortunate. Many bear the physical and emotional scars of war and service. Many are facing homelessness. They need assistance, and California is committed to serving them as they've served us. That is, that is why this year we've initiated the $50 million California Veterans Health Initiative to support veterans' mental health and suicide prevention. And this September, in partnership with the legislature, we passed measures in advance Southern California Veterans Cemetery in Orange County and to assist LBGTQ veterans discharged from the service under Don't Ask, Don't Tell in pursuing discharge upgrades to reestablish their eligibility for veterans benefits in California. As many communities today observe the traditional parades, picnics, celebrations we have enjoyed over the decades, let us all recognize that the commitment personal sacrifices that our veterans have made to defend our way of life command gratitude, respect each and every day of the year. <clears throat> and as Americans and Californians, we have no higher duty than to ensure that our veterans are supported, connected, and respected in their communities. Now, therefore, I, Gavin Newsom, Governor of the State of California, do hereby proclaim November 11, 20. 22 as Veterans Day. In witness of, <clears throat> I have underset my hand and caused the great seal of the state of California to be affixed on the second day of November 2022. Gavin Newsom, attested by Shirley M. Weber, PhD, Secretary of State. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to thank uh, uh, Supervisor Aaron Hannigan for uh, attending. Could you please stand up so everybody can see who you are. Thank you. And I'd also, I would also like to uh, recognize Vice Mayor Rosanna Verder Aliga. Thank you for, for being here. I would now like to invite Charles Spear to the podium, please. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am Charles Spear, the Senior Vice Commander of VFW Post 1123. And I'm honored to introduce the United States Coast Guard Captain Holly Harrison. 
Captain Harrison assumed the duties of Chief of Response for the 11th Coast Guard District in Alameda, California on July 2021. She oversees all U.S. Coast Guard search and rescue, law enforcement, and other operational missions encompassing the states of California, Arizona, Nevada, and Utah. Over a thousand miles of coastline, waters extending offshore over a thousand miles, and offshore waters in the Eastern Pacific off Mexico and Central America down to South America. Her awards include the Bronze Star Medal, which she earned during Operation Iraqi Freedom while she was in charge of the 110-foot cutter Aquindec Neck, which patrolled the uh, Kawar and Abad Ala waterway separating Iraq and Kuwait. The rest of her bio was in the program. So without further ado, here's Captain Holly Harrison. Good morning. Uh, first of all, I am tremendously honored to be here, uh, and, and um, it's, it's kind of interesting looking out this audience. I see so many uh, shipmates uh, and friends. Uh, we, we could have served together. You could have been my grandfather, my mother, my father, my aunts, uncles, cousins. Um, so family. Anyone in uniform is family, so it's a tremendous honor to be here. So uh, thinking about what to uh, talk about today, they say uh, talk about what you know. So. Uh, as a cutterman, that's what we call the Coasties who uh, sail ships for a living, uh, we like to tell stories. So I want to just briefly mention a few uh, veterans and the impact they had on me, but really I could tell a story about any single one of you. Um, so this year in particular is, is uh, special to the U.S. Coast Guard because it marks the 80th anniversary of the Battle of Guadalcanal. And there's a special relationship between the United States Marine Corps and the United States Coast Guard that comes from that battle. Uh, on 27 September, 1942, there were 500 Marines or so who were pinned down on all sides by Japanese forces. And they were trying desperately to get to the beach so they could be evacuated. The US Navy was, was uh, trying to give them cover fire and clear a path for them to get to the beach. But once they, once they got to the beach, they were sitting, sitting ducks, no cover uh, under Japanese fire. US Coast Guard signalman first class Douglas Monroe was in charge of 21, excuse me, 24 Higgins boats. And he and his team uh, their mission was to go and get these Marines off the beach. And while they, they loaded these boats, uh, heavily laden with Marines and equipment, not exactly very swift or nimble as they tried to get off the beaches, Signalman First Class Douglas Monroe took his Higgins boat and put it between the Marines and the Japanese fire. And with that, he was mortally wounded. His last words were, did they get off? He is the only Coast Guardsman in the history of the U.S. Coast Guard to receive the Medal of Honor. We, uh, Every, every Coast Guardsman knows who Douglas Monroe is. I've had the pleasure of, of visiting his grave outside of Seattle. One of our new national security cutters, homeported here in uh, Alameda, California, is named Monroe in his honor. He, as many others have done in our history, gallantly gave his life to serve others. There are others who serve, though. And elsewhere in World War II, my great-grandfather, Rear Admiral Robert English, was commander of U.S. Submarine Pacific Forces. I never met him because he didn't survive the war. He didn't die in combat. As would have it, he was called to a meeting at the Pentagon and his Pan Am Clipper flight from Hawaii was landing here in San Francisco. As you know, with Carl the Fog here in San Francisco, uh, it can be quite treacherous uh, vi visual conditions and his plane slammed into the side of a mountain near Ukiah. So while he did not uh, die in combat, he, he obviously, I think there's, there's some irony to the fact that he was uh, related to a call to the Pentagon. Um, meetings there, as it were. But um, fast forward a little bit. My grandfather was uh, a midshipman at the Naval Academy. He was class in 1946. So World War II was going on, and the Navy needed these graduates out in the field immediately. So he got the fast track plan three years. They accelerated their training at the Naval Academy, but he graduated just in time to see the end of World War II. So he never saw service in combat, but he served nonetheless. He was a naval uh, test pilot. He flew over 60 planes in his career, and some of his squadron mates and best friends you might recognize, such as Wally Schra and John Glenn, who went on to become Mercury astronauts. He also got to fly spy missions during uh, the Cold War, most of which uh, I don't even know the full stories of because they were classified. Now fast forward a bit. It's the early 1970s, and women are now allowed to join the military. My mother, coming from a proud Navy family, 
signed up, went to officer candidate school. She met my dad in, in uh, Kaneohe, Hawaii, where he was a Marine Corps fighter pilot. But when Vietnam happened, Marine Corps fighter pilot, he deployed to Vietnam. My mother was not allowed to deploy to Vietnam with her unit because at that time, women were not allowed in combat. But still, nonetheless, she signed up, she volunteered, and she served. Fast forward into the 1980s, and now women are allowed to attend uh, the service academy. In the United States Coast Guard, Lieutenant Junior Grade Beverly Kelly was the first woman to command a Coast Guard cutter. In fact, she was the first woman to command any naval ship in the United States. Later on, when she commanded another ship as a 270-foot medium endurance cutter, uh, when she went to work with some of our DOD services, who still didn't allow women to serve in, uh, on ships, they didn't want to work with her. They had to work through her executive officer, but she still found a way to make it work. Now fast forward to my personal story. It is now the fall of 2002. This is one year after 9-11. And four Coast Guard patrol boats are given orders to suddenly get to Portsmouth, Virginia. Didn't know why, didn't know what was going on, but we, we saw the news. We knew things, tensions were escalating with, uh, with Iraq. I looked around at these four Coast Guard cutter crews. These are small patrol boats. Uh, they were all male crews. I was the only female in the group. I was the commanding officer of one of the uh, patrol boats. And so I had separate quarters. The other, uh, for the enlisted crew and others, the quarters didn't allow for that. It was all one big birthing area. So I was a little nervous as I'm looking around, wondering if they're gonna let me serve. But here's how our, uh, you know, an example of how our service has um, progressed over the years. I didn't have to worry about it because the Coast Guard commander in charge of the entire operation found me and said, you're the commanding officer of the ship, you're going. And when we got over to work with the Navy overseas, they couldn't have cared less. What mattered was uh, I was there with my crew and we were there to serve a mission. And so while my mother wasn't allowed to serve overseas, uh, in a combat zone, I was allowed to with my crew, and that was my distinct honor and privilege, and those shipmates will be literally shipmates for life. I was texting with them this morning. Um, it's funny trading all of our pictures from years ago when we all looked a little bit younger, um, but uh, tremendous honor to have served. And then, <laughs> thank you. To bring this full circle, now uh, as a senior captain in the Coast Guard, uh, my last command was in command of Coast Guard Cutter Kimball, one of those 419-foot national security cutters like we have in Alameda. She was stationed in Hawaii, and even though it was COVID, we were still on deployment throughout the Pacific, and I found myself in the South Pacific and the Solomon Islands. Had an opportunity to sail the exact waters off Guadalcanal, Point Cruz, where Signalman First Class Douglas Monroe had given his life. And I'm going to tell you, uh, as a cutterman and a coastie, we had several Marines on board. We held a, a, a ceremony for the entire ship's crew. Uh, it, was, it was quite a, a, a moment um, to sail those waters. We also had an opportunity to sail uh, by Iwo Jima and Mount, Sea Mount Suribachi. And it's one thing to read about these stories. It's another to stand there where it's actually happened. So tremendously moving for me. So with that, looking at my career and those of many others, we would not be here today if it were not for those of you who served before us. All of us who currently wear the active duty uniform stand on the shoulders of all of you who served. And it doesn't matter where you served. It doesn't matter what service, what you did, how long you served, whether it was two years, four years, 20 years, 30 years or more. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you served in combat or not. Each and every single person who served stood up to defend our nation. And it takes a team to operate. My ship, I got to go sail the Pacific, but it would not have happened if I didn't have uh, folks back home who first designed and built these ships, contracted to get them made, all the logistics to set up our new home port, uh, the food, the fuel, you know, everything it takes to operate those ships behind the scenes. Um, every single person uh, was a part of our success. So with that, um, I know that each and every one of you who put on a uniform proudly served our nation and you blazed the path and set the standard for those of us serving today. So with that, I wanna say thank you for your dedication, your selfless service and humility. I am tremendously honored to stand with you and words can never fully express our gratitude for all that you have done for our nation. Thank you and God bless. Thank you for being here. That was that was great. I didn't actually know that whole story about Guadalcanal. I was in the Marine Corps. I probably should have. Uh, 
I would now I'd like to invite Captain Tom Snyder, United States Navy, retired, to the podium. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. I'm Tom Snyder, a VFW Post 1123 surgeon and a retired Medical Corps officer in the United States Navy and Navy Reserve. I'm honored to introduce United States Navy Rear Admiral Leonard C. Butch DeLaga. Admiral DeLaga is a native of Vallejo, proudly attended Vallejo City Unified School District Schools, was a Hogan High School Navy Junior Reserve Officer Training Corps cadet, and graduated in 1986 with honors. From there, he went to the Naval Academy where he graduated in 1990 with a Bachelor of Science degree in Mechanical Engineering. A different kind of engineering there, I think. He also holds a Master's degree in Engineering Management from George Washington University in DC. Rear Admiral DeLaga's sea tours include division officer assignments in USS Los Angeles, SSN 688, engineer officer in USS Rhode Island, SSBN 740, and executive officer in USS Cheyenne, SSN 773. He commanded USS Charlotte, SSN 766, in Pearl Harbor, and also served as Commodore of Submarine Development Squadron 12 in Groton, Connecticut. The rest of his bio is in the program, so without further ado, I'm honored to present Rear Admiral DeLaga. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning. Wow, this is a great crowd. Definitely appreciate you coming out. Love this weather. Uh, my wife, Lonnie, and I were texting this morning, and she said, I can see that it's sunny in Vallejo because it's raining in D.C. <laughs> So well done, Cheeky, get me out here. Cheeky's my aide. He always gets me home. Uh, first off, it's such an honor to be with you today. It's always great to break away from the hallowed halls of the Pentagon, uh, particularly special today to be here in my hometown of Vallejo. A city that so clearly values their military and the service American military members and their families have made throughout history. Family. So we're gathered here today to pay tribute to the heroes walking among you in the city of Vallejo who selflessly served our nation. But before I begin, I would be remiss if, not, if I did not say thanks to all those who have coordinated this ceremony and who have planned many over the years. Specifically, I want to thank Mr. Nestor Aliga and his better half, Vice Mayor Aliga for the countless hours they put forth of putting this together. More importantly, crow barring me out of the Pentagon so I could come visit my hometown and visit my family. So I'm humbled and honored to stand in front of everyone, in front of so many great Americans and heroes of our nation who paved the way for me. This morning I wanna talk a little bit about Vallejo, service, and of course, our veterans. Three things I think is meant, we're meant to reflect on on this great day. So Vallejo, I was born and raised and grew up in Vallejo and as a young kid, I'd walk the waterfront right here, looking across Mare Island Strait to the Mare Island Naval Shipyard and those sleek black things that just hover right over the water called submarines. Now I never thought at that time that I would be good enough to join the silent service of the United States Submarine Force. And in truth, I may have never made it to where I am today if it was not for the phenomenal parents that I had, my sisters uh, who taught me because I had no brothers, so they had to keep me on the straight and narrow, my teachers, school administrators, and mentors that I had from this great city. Specific calls out to two individuals who got me through the tough times of Vallejo Public Schools when I was bullied. And that's Joy Perseveranda Putong, my best friend from middle school into high school and her 
older brother, J.F. Perseveranda. All that stuff you did, look at me now. So luckily, this city looked out for me and put me on the right path to apply for and be accepted into the United States Naval Academy. Again, a product of Vallejo Public Schools. Then, fast forward to not only joining the Navy, but being a lieutenant on board a nuclear-powered fast attack submarine, the USS Los Angeles, that was being overhauled, say it with me, at Mare Island Naval Shipyard from 1993 to 1995. It is then that I recognized firsthand the phenomenal capability of the men and women here in Vallejo who worked in the shipyard that was able to repair that national defense asset and get us out of the shipyard early. You never hear that, you would never hear about that nowadays. And I could not at the time have been more proud of my hometown and being able to do that. And as I walk around Vallejo today and see all the people gathered here to recognize these veterans, I feel completely awestruck by the continued support of the military and our veterans from the city of Vallejo. You understand that the sacrifices these young men and women made throughout history have not only given us the freedom to come together like this, but they've given people like me a chance to serve our great country as well. The individuals you honor have given something up for all of us, and it's truly inspiring. And I know you too have been inspired because this year's tribute is one of the biggest there's ever been to date, with multiple events throughout the day that will have nearly a thousand people in attendance. I understand a little later this afternoon, Six Flags Discovery Kingdom, the first Purple Heart Park on the West Coast, will open the park to all veterans with free admission and pay tribute to the military. What a sight that will be to behold today. Now let's talk a little bit about service. I know I don't have to tell anyone here the importance of service to our, to our country. And I don't just mean military service. There are so many other ways to serve our community and our great nation to give back. The more we serve our communities, the more we encourage the next generation to do the same thing. Now my service has afforded me so many incredible opportunities, not the least of which is being here with you today. Throughout my 32 years in the Navy, I have commanded USS Charlotte Fast Tech Submarine out of Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, served as Commodore on Submarine Development Squadron 12, leading nine fast attack submarines that deployed in the Atlantic and the Indian Ocean, as well as the Pacific, and becoming my current job, the Chief of Legislative Affairs for the Secretary of the Navy and the Chief of Naval Operations. Before this job, I was blessed to have commanded Submarine Group 7 in Yokosuka, Japan, in charge of all submarine operations in the Western Pacific and the Indian Ocean. So think Russia, China, and Iran. I've completed three overseas deployments in the Pacific as well as the Indian Ocean and five strategic deterrent patrols in the Atlantic. So it's not lost on me that many of these opportunities came as a result of those who paved the way. Not just those that I mentioned from the city of Vallejo, but also those who served that I may have never known, which is why I wanna spend my last minutes talking about them, our veterans. So when I was in Vallejo last month, I had an incredible opportunity to link up with the submarine veterans of American Legion Post 550 and share stories about their time in the service. From one person to the next, I heard of adversities, but also of harrowing moments of pride in their time serving in the Navy. There were stories of sacrifice, but also of lives well lived. Now, Captain, Captain Holly Harrison, Thank you for sharing your story and remarks with us today. I love the fact that you have a connection to the submarine force. And thank you for your service in protecting this great Bay Area. And like I told you earlier, I'm a little jealous that you get to live uh, and work in Alameda and just overlooking the Bay. Then there's another veteran story that I wanna share with you. His story is special to me and to the United States Navy. It is the story of Fireman Telus Flora de la Cruz Trinidad, the only Filipino in the United States Navy to be awarded the Medal of Honor. 
He received the honor for his actions on the USS San Diego in 1915 and at a time when it could be awarded for non-combat valor. You see, Trinidad, who died in 1968 at age 77, was aboard the USS San Diego in January 1915 when the boilers exploded, killing nine and injuring several others. And at the time of the explosion, Trinidad was driven out of fire room number two by the force of the blast. But he at once returned and picked up fireman second class Daly, whom he saw to be injured, and proceeded to bring him out. While passing into fire room number four, Trinidad was just in time to catch the explosion from the number three fire room, and without consideration of his own safety, and although badly burned about the face, he passed daily onto someone else and then assisted in rescuing another injured man from fire room number three. Telesforo Trinidad was among the more than 250,000 Filipino soldiers who served in both world wars, but it, but he is the first and only to have been awarded the Medal of Honor. And earlier this year, my boss, Secretary of the Navy, Carlos Del Toro, announced that Telesforo Trinidad will be the first American of Filipino descent to have a U.S. Navy ship named after him, a future Arla Burke class guided missile destroyer. Now his story is for the history books and one that I'm proud to share with all of you gathered here today. But there are many other stories from our veterans that will not be written down. And as a child, I was fortunate to hear from those, of those stories from my father and my stepfather, both who served. My charge to you gathered here today is to seek them out and listen. And I guarantee they will inspire you and others for generations to come. Now in closing, I wanna thank you Vallejo for your unyielding support for our service members and your military. Your Navy is grateful to have you. You are the reason we get underway and go far from home for six months at a time on deployment to carry out our nation's missions in defense of our great country. And to all the veterans, active duty and reserve service members here, thank you for your service. I know I stand on the shoulders of giants, such as Ray, part of the greatest generation, and I'm humbled and grateful to be part of today's ceremony. For the leaders of Vallejo, thank you for continuing to believe in this great city that has inspired generations of children to serve their country. Every day, those of us in uniform continue to serve. We are reminded of and grateful for all of you who have made our service possible. God bless you. God bless our United States veterans and God bless the United States of America. Thank you. Thank you, Rear Admiral. It's really nice to uh, not only have a Rear Admiral for a guest speaker, but one who's from Vallejo and a Hogan High graduate like me. <laughs> <laughs> right. I was, I was er, earlier. I was remiss. I missed K Katie Meisner, uh, Meisner. Sorry, <laughs> Vallejo City Council. I want to thank you for being here. Thank you. Jay, I, again, you're right, but I apologize. Now I'd like to invite VFW Post 1123 and Vietnam, our Air Force veteran, Hank Howard, to the podium. Thank you. I'd like the uh, guards to come forward with the uh, Medal of Honor presentation. Have George Fuller and Dayton Smith will present the sign of the Medal of Honor to our podium on the easel there. This is a sign that was made here in Vallejo uh, of the three Medal of Honors. I will discuss them in a minute here. Is it going to hold up there without flying away? George, will you t stand on the other side of that? And get a picture thank you thank you you're dismissed thank you
Good morning, veterans. This is a sign I used to say every morning to listen to in Vietnam. And when we listen to it, we listen to it on AFN, which is the Armed Forces Network. And that was a good saying. If you heard, good morning, Vietnam, every day, it was a great day for your day to live in Vietnam. But this morning, I also bid good morning to Rear Admiral Delaga, sir. And I also bid good morning to Captain Holly Harrison. Thank you. And also to all of Vallejo, good morning. The Veterans of Foreign Wars Post 1123 is your host for this ceremony this morning. As a post commander, I can inform you that we are the largest VFW post in District 16, which covers a lot of Northern California counties. I'm honored to discuss to you the history about Vallejo Medal of Honor recipients. And it's an interesting history. Who were all either born in here, Vallejo, or maybe they were on a ship over there on Coast Guard in the back in history, or they may have been on ships that were supported from uh, Vallejo all over the world. Early awards were for valor of deeds performed, and they may have been for personal or conspicuous valor and com clearly distinguished themselves above and beyond their fellow veterans that may have involved a risk of life. The Medal of Honor is the highest military award for valor in action. The Medal of Honor reminds you of extraordinary feats of courage and self-sacrifice that ordinary soldiers and sailors, Marines and airmen perform for their country and their fellow service people in times of war. Today, there are three distinct medals, as you see them on this display here. One is, was the first one was for the Army, the second was for the Navy, and the third was for the Air Force, which was created after the 1947. Prior to 1947, the medal, most of the medals were the uh, Army Air Corps are, were presented under the Army's auspices. In most cases, the medal is presented by the President of the United States. It's a pretty high honor. And I say in most cases, and sometimes some of those people never got to have that opportunity who were awarded there. The Medal of Honor was first established at the beginning of the Civil War in July of 1862. It is awarded to individuals in the armed forces who distinguish themselves above and beyond the call of duty. 69 medals have been awarded to non-military uh, service people, but they were mostly Canadians who served side by side with us during World War I and World War II. The Medal of Honor has been awarded 3,473 times to deserving individuals or posthumously during the Civil War, 1861, the Medal of Honor was presented 523 times. Think about that in those days that they put this uh, process together. During World War I, it was awarded 121 times. During World War II, it was awarded 473 times to soldiers, sailors, Marines, Marines, Army. Jeff is one of the few of us. And uh, Air, Army Air Corps and the U.S. Coast Guardsmen. It is noted that 266 medals were presented to Vietnam veterans of the U.S. Army, Air Force, Navy, Marines, and the U.S. Air Force. Only seven medals of honor have been presented since the Vietnam concluded. Two for, for actions in Somalia, four for actions in Iraq, and one for actions in Afghanistan. And I believe there's three other which are in process by President Biden to be presented in, in the near future. The Medal of Honor maintains the official records, the Medal of Honor Society maintains the official records of the Medal of Honor recipients, the history of interest, 
and individual testimony of heroic actions and achievements of valor for accomplishment of each medal. You can Google it, go on the internet, and just Google uh, Medal of Honor uh, recipients and you'll bring this right up and there's, it's unbelievable the history that is there. There's a declining number of living Medal of Honor recipients. Now this today, the number is still at uh, 103. It is declining rapidly because the group would end some of the, I think the last Medal of Honor recipient from World War II just recently died last week. We're now into the group of Vietnam veterans and etc. downward. The first Medal of Honor was presented to the Army to Private Jacob Parrott during the Civil War. The first woman to receive the Medal of Honor and only recipient of Medal of Honor was uh, Dr. Mary Edward Walker. If you have a chance, look up on the history of that. And this is a fantastic story of a woman's four or five year of combat experience in the Civil War. And she established a lot of practices that hold today in the U.S. Army medical side. The first African-American was awarded a medal and his name was William Carney. There have been 87 African-Americans who received the medal, the recipients. There have been 22 Native Americans and 22 Asian American recipients. The first Philippine Medal of Honor was awarded to Jose, Jose Nisperos. Did I say it right? Nisperos. Nisperos. Nisperos on February 3, 1913, while serving with the U.S. Philippine Scouts. Ladies and gentlemen, we had a lot of things going on in 1913 in, the, in World War I areas and also different things there. The first and only Coast Guard Medal was awarded to Douglas A. Moreau, presented during World War II. Thank you, Captain. Early this morning, a companion Veterans Day ceremony was held across the water at the Mare Island Naval Cemetery. We're over there. There's 962 veterans buried in that cemetery. The last veterans that was buried in that cemetery was in 1921. So there's a history over there. There is a, some of us know of it, some of us respect it, and some of us need to learn more about it. When the base, when the Navy left Mare Island, the cemetery was left in an unrepaired condition. That happened during President Clinton's administration. A Ralph Parrott, a retired Navy captain, visited the cemetery on a lark. And afterwards, he came close contact with the former mayor, Bob Sampayan. This is not Bob up here. <laughs> anyway, I appreciate just making this, this point. Uh, anyway, what happened was that Captain Parrott was very disturbed about the conditions that were left there and where it was headed or what he found. And as a captain, he teamed up with a veteran and member of our post, Nestor Ligda, who's over here on the camera. <laughs> Nestor being a retired Army colonel, he became the point man and an advocate and organizer to restore the United States Navy Cemetery here on Mare Island. This was not an easy process. It took him five years a lot of travel across the United States, back and forth, standing before the Congress of the United States, in congressmen's offices, a lot of time, a lot of travel, right, Rosanna? Yeah. <laughs> and after five years, they were successful on May 16, 2022, of getting the Congress to sponsor bills. 
to award the, to open the cemetery or change the cemetery to clean it up and take care of it. Senator Diane Feinstein and Representative Mike Thompson and also uh, Representative John Garamendi were, were involved in the approval and having the cemetery placed under control of the National Veterans Affairs Administration. And that would be taken care of under their cemetery auspices. So why is this important that I tell you this about Mare Island and what we got have happening over there? The importance is, is that there's 982 people buried over there. There is three Medal of Honor recipients buried in that cemetery. And we have two other recipients buried here in Vallejo. Now, Nestor Lega was not finished, as usual. He's always doing something. <laughs> he authored the background information to honor the, National, the Medal of Honor recipient, Telesforo Trinidad, which the Admiral just talked about. He was honored to have a destroyer named after him, which I think is amazing. And he's be the first Filipino to have that honor of, of a ship named after him for the U.S. Navy. And that was done by Carlos Del Toro, the Navy Secretary. I thank you. I thank you, Admiral, for bringing that to, to light. And also thank you for the work that you did to bring that to a level. Nestor has been successful in obtaining two Medal of Honor designations for our uh, area for Vallejo. He wrote the legislation to have the state of California name Interstate 80 Westbound Rest Area as a Medal of Honor Safety roads, Roadside Rest Area. That's a lot to say in one sentence. But anyway, and a future monument to be placed in a site along uh, I-80. So they're going to do some signage up there when they get some. Most of the signs are made in a prison somewhere, I think. Anyway. This was approved by the California Senate and approved by Senator Bill Dodd. So we appreciate Senator Bill Dodd's effort. Concurrent to the rest stop actions, Nestor Legda next developed legislation with the California State Representative Tim Grayson to uh, name the Vallejo intersection Cloverleaf of Interstate I-80 and I-780 as the Congressional Gold Medal of Honor Interchange. The VFW Post co-signed co legislation and supportive letters for these actions. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand with me if you can and join me in a warm hands of applause for the outstanding task and accomplishments of Nestor Alegda. Thank you, Nestor, for all what you do for veterans in Vallejo. Thank you, Nestor. I told him to be here, too. <laughs> Nestor serves as our public information officer for our post, and he's a member of our post. Next, I can relay to you today that there are 17 Vallejo Medal of Honor recipients. And from the annals of the Medal of Honor Society, I'll now kind of list them very briefly, because I know we've all been here for a while. But I will give you some idea about each one of them. And I can tell you that the Admiral has talked about a couple of them. So has Captain Harrison, but I'll repeat some of this for you. First off is William S. Bond. He's the oldest grave. He's in the Sunrise Cemetery. And he was aboard the USS Kursage and during during the Civil War period of time, and why this ever happened, I cannot figure this out, but they were at Cherbourg, France, and in a ship called, and they destroyed a ship called the Alabama. Now, Alabama was not a U.S. ship, it was a Confederate ship. So you might hear me relating this to you a couple of times. In his burial, uh, he, this happened on June 19th, 1864. Now we're going back a few years here. His burial, as I said, was in Sunrise here in Vallejo. 
Number two is Richard A. Richard D. Dunphy, the United States aboard the USS Hartford in the metal in the Mobile Bay in Mobile Bay, Alabama, during the Civil War on August 5, 1864, aboard the USS Hartford which rammed the ship, Tennessee, which a Confederate ship, and took on heroic actions while under cannon fire and rifles. Dunphy was injured in that combat. He lived afterwards, but uh, the Tennessee was captured. He is buried in the St. Vincent Cemetery, it's way out in the other part of town, and in Vallejo. Richard Willis, United States Navy, aboard the U.S. New Ironside, Think about this, This you might have seen some movies about stuff like this with Johnny Depp and things like that. I'll bring his name up a couple of times. But the ironclad ships fought against Fort Fisher cannons in North Carolina. George Carter, United States Army, 8th Cavalry, Arizona Territory. Now all these people I'm talking about are, are part of the 17 that have some connection with Vallejo, they were either born here or so forth. So when I talk about these guys who are involved in, or these soldiers who are involved in the Indian campaigns, August 13th, 1868, cited for bravery in scouts and actions against Indians. Patrick Burke, United States 8th Cavalry, Arizona Territory, Indian campaign, cited for bravery in scouts and actions against Indians. William Halford, United States Navy aboard the USS Saginaw in the Pacific Ocean, 1865 to 1870 era. On October 31st, he was the sole survivor of a crew that was sent to Sandwich Islands for assistance to the US Saginaw wreck. Now, some of you might say, where the heck is the Sandwich Islands? Anyway, it used to be known as Hawaii, or was Hawaii, later named Hawaii. So his burial is here in uh, Mare Island Navy uh, Cemetery across the way. Thomas Lakin, United States Navy aboard the USS Narragansett, Mare Island Naval Yard, 1871. On between 1871 and 1898, he was stationed there. On November 24, 1874, Lakin jumped overboard. This is an amazing story. I'll have to I'll take a couple minutes off script here. He rescued two crewmates from the frigid waters of the Napa River. This water right out here, think about this. This happened on November 24. He was on board the ship in his Navy work a uniform, Brogan boots on, went off the ship into the water and rescued two guys. Came back out. He lived for quite a while afterwards too. Lived to almost be a hundred years old. So it's quite a, I mean, it's amazing feat. Alexander Parker, United States Navy, aboard the U.S. Portsmouth, Mare Island Naval Yard, 1871 to 1898 era. It's on July 25th, 1876, he rescued another crewmate out of the cold waters of Napa River. Burial is in Mare Island Cemetery. Henry Thompson, United States Navy, assigned to the U.S. Pensacola, Mare Island Naval Yard. You might hear me being said Naval Yard, Navy Yard, because that's the way it was designated in those days, not the shipyard for rescuing a man from drowning at Mare Island. That's gonna blow down, Jeff's gonna just pull it down. At Mare Island Navy Yard and cold water of Navy. William Johnson, United States Navy, assigned to USS Adams. Mare Island Navy Yard for rescued a workman who had fell off of a ship from drowning in the waters of the Napa River over here. Johan Johansson, United States Navy aboard the USS Nash Nashville at Center Fuegos, Cuba during the Spanish-American War, May 11th, 1898. I have to tell you this story about this guy. He, uh, he took a knife in his mouth and shimmied down a hawser rope 
that was holding the ship under combat with a knife in his mouth. He went down this hawser rope and shimmied down and cut the rope so the ship could leave the harbor. Amazing. Medal of Honor guy. James Cooney. Rock. <laughs> Jeff told me to say this, but anyway. U.S. Marine Corps, Tianjin, China. During the Boxer Rebellion, July 13th, 1900. In the presence of enemy fire while under assault, he exhibited courage and valor under numerous attacks. James Cooney is buried in the cemetery on Mare Island, an honorable grave site and a, a respect to him and to our nation. John Dahlgren, United States Marine Corps at Peking, China during the Boxer Rebellion. Outstanding courage. Frank Young, U.S. Marine Corps, Peking, China during the Boxer Rebellion. Ex exhibited outstanding courage. Reinhard Kepler, bringing you up to here a little bit earlier. There was discussion about the Solomon Islands. During World War II and during, during this time, twice, during uh, under attack, the uh, ship uh, San Francisco was attacked twice in w one day and by a Japanese torpedo boat. The torpedo hit the ship and uh, did damage and uh, Kepler was a damage control person. Ray Wilson up here is a damage control guy. He remembers, he listened up when I said that. Anyway, he was killed in action. He exhibited exceptional bravery. He gallantly gave up his life. This was a posthumous award presented by the President of the United States to his family. Robert Young, United States 1st Cavalry Division, North Quezon, Korea. October 9th, 1950, a miraculous soldier. He was wounded four times in the same combat operation, conflict. He was evacuated during this unbelievable war. I have a Korean War veteran sitting in the front row here, Joe Mickelson, but we honor him. And he was evacuated, Young was evacuated to a U.S. Army uh, MASH Hospital. Some of you might have seen some of those things on TV a few years ago. His family was presented the Medal of Honor posthumously in Washington, D.C. And lastly, in my group of 17, is a, an amazing guy, Anun Rourke, United States Army 4th Infantry Division, Kantum Province, Vietnam, on May 16, 1868. In an overwhelming attack by the North Vietnamese uh, Army, Viet Cong, his army, his company was attacked, and he was in a point, as a point man, in a bunker, in a security bunker, and under siege, the, uh, the, comp, the post was overwhelmed, the combat post was overwhelmed, and he, uh, they were throwing grenades at, at the bunker, uh, and a bunker la a grenade landed in the bunker, and Rourke took his body and laid it over the grenade and took the, took a grenade. Um, amazing uh, combat action. The Medal of Honor was presented posthumously by Richard uh, Nixon. I want to say a couple things about, we talk about a lot of these Medal of Honor people that are gone, but I've got to say a few things about Vallejo, Benicia, and American Canyon heroes over the last few years. First off, these people uh, have passed us, have gone to pass. Sergeant Elmer Krauss, 2004. First Lieutenant Michael Vega, 2004. Master Sergeant Jude Mar Mariano, Lance Corporal, Lance Corporal Philip West, 
He's from American Canyon in 2004. Lieutenant Dustin Shumi of Benicia, 2005. Army Specialist Christopher Rose, 2006. Pacific or Private First Class Jennifer Cole, 2008. Also Army Specialist Garrett Fett of American Canyon. And I want to thank Mark Kearney for, of Vallejo for putting this information into the scribe. In closing, VFW Post 1123 is honored today to relay this information to you. I'm not sure all of you in Vallejo had any idea or even knew that there was so many Vallejo, uh, Medal of Honor recipients in Vallejo, uh, uh, with Vallejo. Thank you for letting me bring forth this information today. I'm so proud of our post, all of our members over here on the group for the efforts as we continue to monitor the five Medal of Honor burial sites here in Vallejo and Mare Island Naval Cemetery. As you drive around Vallejo, you may come across one of our cemeteries here on the Sunrise Cemetery and notice that the graves of over 1,200 veterans have been decorated with American flags. This was accomplished by scout troops and who posted the flags. Thank you to the scout leaders, Chuck Chuck Spear here, and also to the VFW Post 1123 for overseeing the task and support. Yesterday, over 3,500 graves were, post, were decorated with American flags by 42 Navy Junior ROTC cadets from the Jesse Bethel High School. I've done this thing for about three years in a row. We do them on Memorial Day and so forth. Yesterday, all of the Navy cadets that go to high school and are in the program of the JROTC, which the Admiral was in years ago, all of them were in uniform, a working uniform. They were in their cargo, uh, Navy pants, jerseys. It was beautiful. I mean, and they worked over those cemeteries. They posted 3,500 flags. There is a lot of veterans in these cemeteries here in Vallejo. Thank you f goes out to Chief Ivory Hood of the uh, uh, program co coordinator and the captain Orcero who has left us. He was here this morning but left. Also to Bob Fernell, our quartermaster, who helped us support vehicle yesterday and Captain Tom Snyder for that. I leave you with the final thought. According to the census, of 2021 released, there are 6,800 veterans who live in the city of Vallejo. Thank you. Thank you, Post Commander Howard. Could everybody please rise? Uh, can I have Mike Featherstone please come forward? Okay. Order or present arms. I'm going to make this short. Our Heavenly Father. We ask, uncover our Heavenly Father, we ask that you would dismiss us with your blessing and grant that we may continually experience the calmness and serenity of heart and, which, of, and soul which comes from you. Make us useful servants in all things. Amen. Cover. And Jeff Hall will give us our finishing, concluding remarks. Please be seated. Don't worry, they're really short. <laughs> I'd like to thank the city of everybody who participated, who made this come together. Thank you. I couldn't have done it without you. City of Vallejo, big help, really helped set this up. And I have to thank Nestor Liga. Not only was he a retired Army Colonel, but he was a fellow Marine. Oh. Semper Fi. Thank you for all your help.
Thank you to all of our service members and fellow veterans for your service and to our great nation. To our great nation. Thank you, families and friends, for being here today and to pay tribute to all our troops and vet veterans. May God bless each one of us. May always God bless the United States of America. And that concludes it. Thank you.